Welcome back class. Um, this will be a follow-up uh, lesson to what we learned in the last video about B&M. Now with this one, this is an example of what a B&M roller coaster, either a sit-down, a floorless, and possibly a stand-up. Most of those typical B&M coasters pretty much have the same ride layouts, the way um, <coughs> the way they uh, entertain guests are so similar uh, the ride layout is very similar compared to all floorless sit-downs and um, even possibly stand-ups. Stand-ups possibly have maybe one thing that they, I'm not sure, well, I don't know, maybe they can do all of this. It doesn't matter. It, I really don't think it matters at all. Especially that first version I will show you about this park or this, not park, but this particular ride but of course, other um, B&M coasters such as fly, flying roller coasters, winged coasters, um, even inverted coasters do have their um, their own set of elements and um, uh, overall basic ride layout. So with this one, I have set up an example of how B&M does their roller coasters. Uh, first off, we're going to go ahead and start off with a basic station. This doesn't also, this also doesn't relate to B&M, but also every other typical uh, roller coaster in every and any theme park. First off, we're going to go ahead and start with the station. Um, this one is rather aired out. There's not, a, it's not that indoors. It's got its basic roof. Um. You know, they're really, I don't really know. I guess it's just uh, when they make it this uh, simple, it's the cheapest way to go compared to like other um, other roller coasters, of course, like Disney. Of course, most of their stuff is indoors and highly themed. With this one, I'm just going for a basic look. Um, of course, you have the control box area where they all go into, or the ride operators go in. Um, of course, in regular scenery for roller coaster for scenery for roller coaster tycoon 3 there isn't any uh, uh, control panels unless I put let's see maybe this or is it like that but that only works if there's a uh, what's it called a wild path a walkway path so I'm not even gonna bother just use your imaginations that if there's something in there um Something rather small and almost uh, insignificant, however, it does add to the realism, is this lower area of the uh, station. Usually, this is best for people, or this is like a storage area for separate parts for a coaster, also for maintenance crew, possibly either during a breakdown or at the end of the day. They go down here, they'll be able to check under the coaster, see if there's any problems. Of course, the catwalk here would be a lot higher. Of course, RCT3 does not allow me to make it any closer to the coaster. This is as close to the coaster as it, as it could get. So, of course, uh, I couldn't get it that close. But, uh, that's about it for the station. Um, let's see here. The back of the station, of course, is the storage shed for the coasters. Usually, any and all coasters usually run about three coasters at a time, depending on how busy the um, either depending how busy the park is or how cheap the labor is for each park. Uh, usually they do. If a, a ride starts off in the beginning, like its first few years, they run all three trains. And of course, as the popularity of the coaster wanes, we got new rides. They usually tend to ride or run at least one or two trains at a time, leaving one for uh, backup maintenance. Uh, left here in the back of these two. Okay. Now then, that's it for um, the station for this ride. It is unnamed, of course. This is only an example. Um, so we're not going to have any particular name for this coaster. Uh, this little element here, which I find intriguing, it was... I got this from Hydra the Revenge, located in um, Kingdoms... Oh shoot, uh, it is located, I know the park is in Pennsylvania, uh, it is located at Dorney Park in Wild Water Kingdom. It's got this interesting element where right before the lift hill 
it does this um, zero G roll or twist right before the chain lift. And of course, it gives the riders a sensation of hanging rather just below. In my in my case, or in our case, the water below. So it gives that feeling that you're about to fall off the ride even just before you even start on the lift hill. So I kind of find that rather interesting for the coaster in uh, Dorney Park. Um, okay, so of course you start off with the chain lift this way. Uh, typically with roller coasters like this, especially with B&Ms, unless it is a hyper coaster, uh, the height usually uh, goes, the height limit for something like this is usually just about 150 feet. Uh, with a roller coaster that doesn't have to deal with um, like airtime, large drops, um, the minimum height for a roller coaster that has plenty of these elements is at least about 150. Um, yeah, that's about it. Unless you want, of course, you want to make it a hyper coaster, which delves much more into the airtime and the camel humps. Uh, feel free to make it a lot bigger. However, with our roller coaster, it delves more into um, inversions and elements rather than trying to lift you off your feet. It's more about uh, disorientation rather than uh, butterflies in your stomach. Um, I mean, if you have noticed that most drops on B&Ms, they have this rather weird hump followed by a flat portion and then the drop. I honestly don't know what the point is for that ro or for that reason or this element here, but I have noticed that mostly some, if not all, B&Ms have this sort of uh, hump and then straight away before the drop. Uh, I guess it's just something that they have to do. I, I haven't even figured it out yet. So, if you are trying to f make a B&M as realistic as possible, it's usually best to add this uh, significant shape to the drop. Uh, next off, uh, it was rather difficult to do this in RCT3 to try and curve it. Um, yeah, try to make a curve of drop because the majority of um, B&M roller coasters do have that curve of drop. Now I know some don't, of course, like Apollo's Chariot that goes straight down. Of course, some Medusas. I mean, there are clones of Medusas, and personally, ours at Six Flags Magic Mountain. Sure, we call it Scream, but that's just—it's just another clone of Medusa. I don't know why Six Flags does that. Maybe to save money. I'm not so sure, but. I guess if you don't, if you can't go on a Medusa on the East Coast, you can go on our screen here on the West Coast. <laughs> but um, yeah, typically most uh, drops on a B&M, you really don't get the butterflies in your stomach feeling because of the way it curves uh, during the drop. So I tried to make a curve here, uh, didn't work out so well because of the limitations of RCT3. However, that's the best I can do for this particular uh, software, game, whatever. Okay, so now we go ahead and go into our first element, a vertical loop. Of course, we've already explained this one before. Uh, it is, something is threading it right in the middle. Uh, mostly, or usually for roller coasters like this, try, it's good to try to make the roller coaster almost look tangled as much as possible. I mean, when you're right here, like your perspective is right here, and you're trying to follow the uh, the path of the coaster, chances are, if it's really this tangled, you're not going to follow it well. It leaves more to it leaves the guest surprised more. It leaves it a mystery. If you keep it like with the inversions like this, if you keep it so tidy and neat. Um, kind of like a, uh, what's it, like a, a hyper coaster where you know where it's going and it's like a uh, back and out coaster where it goes up, down, up, down, up, down, makes a turn, up, down, up, down, up, down. The only thing that does scare them is the drop, everything else is just whatever. But with this one, seeing as if you're looking at it at this angle, you're trying to figure out where that coaster is going to go. If that, if the ride does look really tangled, kind of how it is right now, it does give the guests a little bit more of a surprise when they actually go on it. So it's also a nice tip there. I mean, come on, also, it looks pretty cool when it's threading the loop like that. So there's another tidbit for you guys there. 
Okay, another element that we should be familiar with is, of course, a cobra roll. Now, let's see a little bit more about the cobra roll. If you're going to make one, there are large ones, just like on the Hulk, and there are small ones. Uh, the only... let's see, I'm not sure if the one in Scream is a large uh, cobra roll, but we'll just give... oh, excuse me. We'll just use the Hulk as a perfect example. Uh, with a cobra roll, try to make it so that it is... the half loop here tapers inward. There, let me go ahead and show you an example real quick. It shouldn't take me that long. Okay. So, when building the cobra roll, don't try to make... Well, well, don't try to make something as you make, you're not even, uh, it's kind of hard to pay attention when you're trying to build the whole coaster, but try to get the intricate details of the coaster as much as you can. Now, looking at this one, you'll notice that this cobra roll has a slender look to it. However, with this cobra roll, um, in my personal opinion, I have not seen cobra rolls like this, where it looks like it's got a wide girth to it. Um, I guess, from in my personal opinion, this one does look a lot more sleeker, slender, and it does make the coaster look, I don't know, in my personal opinion, overall more sleek looking compared to something that looks so wide in girth like this. And it's just in a typical aesthetic. Also, another uh, common mistake would be to make it look slanted like this. Now, that one, that... <laughs> to me, that's just, it's kind of twerking my OCD a bit. So, it, maybe there are some Cobra rules out there that have this sort of a slanted look to them. But if you are going to make a Cobra roll, just be sure to make it at least look uh, symmetrical. But I guess, you know, if you want to go for this one, I mean, there are no limits to this. But, you know, these are just my opin or opinions and advice. And you can <laughs> deal with it for whatever you guys want to do. Okay, so after the Cobra roll, let me go ahead and push play. Let's go ahead and see the coaster go through this while we're watching this. The Cobra roll, here they go, go through the loop. Have them go right through the Cobra roll. Nice and smooth. And then finally, we have not really touched upon this sort of uh, element before. Now I know it does look like a, a dive loop to an element loop. However, this significant um, element to a coaster, uh, I think there's only one, at least I, I can think of, that does have this sort of element. Um, unless it is a, uh, a Vacoma inverted coaster. I mean, B&M makes their own inverted coasters, and of course, Vacoma makes their own inverted coasters, which are a pain to ride. <laughs> But uh, let's see, a little more information about this element, which we did not cover. This is called a serpent's roll. Now it is somewhat similar to a cobra roll. It's as if, um, if a cobra roll were a spring, all you'd have to do is just invert this loop as if it were going this way and not a U-turn sort of thing. And I guess that's the uh, best description of a serpent's roll I can think of. Um, in Roller Coaster Tycoon 3, how to make a Serpent's Roll is right here. This would be a dive loop to a 90 degree turn, to a corkscrew, to another corkscrew, and finally to another 90 degree loop, or dive loop here. Um, let's see. After that Serpent's Roll, we're going to go ahead and go to a 0G roll, followed by a bank turn, and finally, an essential to all roller coasters is a brake run. Now usually a brake run is there just in case a coaster decides to not make a loop all the way around or there's sort of a certain emergency that the coaster needs to stop midway through. Um, I kind of made a mistake here that I had to build it in the middle of a lake because of course usually there are um, catwalks here followed by... Um, you know, I guess we can do that right now. Let's go ahead and make a catwalk. But it is a little bit of a mistake to build it in the middle of a of a lake here. <laughs> okay, I seem to have lost the catwalk. There we go. 
It's really just here for aesthetics. We don't really need to make it that. Uh, like it doesn't really need to be connected. So then after that, we're gonna go ahead. And of course, they need to have a stairs stairwell. I mean, and fortunately, it does look a little. Uh, it is obstructing the view. Hopefully, if I make it enough um, floors, most of these pillars will be out of the way and look a little bit better. There. Uh, just for like, you know, purposes, or uh, realistic purposes. Just go ahead and made a catwalk there in case there's some emergency exit we need to do at the top there. Okay, so after the break run, of course, you have your typical loop, followed by another bank turn. A nice little element here where you go ahead and do two more corkscrews, one above the lake to give a nice, possibly a postcard shot here. One more final corkscrew, then through the straightaway onto the brakes, and back into the station. Now then, I know I was going to cover something else pertaining to the ride. Um... Oh uh, yes, quick little edit there, because I needed to think a little bit. Let's go ahead, uh, but then yeah, I figured it out. Um, let's go ahead and look through a little bit of the as aesthetics of this coaster. Uh, now with some of these parts, they are a little dug into the ground. Typically that would be the best way to build something as uh, realistic coaster as possible. I try to, you know, alter the terrain a bit to where it digs down into the ground a little bit. It also gives you a little bit more um, speed uh, when you want the coaster to try and just make the, the loops here. I've had a bit of a problem trying to get loops to... Um, or make the coaster pass through the loops at the right speed. Sometimes it would make it so it just barely goes ever so slowly here and you have the peeps hanging for their lives. Best to keep it at a perfect speed. Also, a few other elements that this, this ride does have that usually only pertains to, I guess, wooden coasters. Is something called a head chopper. I believe I have some here. I'm not sure if this qualifies as a head chopper where it goes just right under the corkscrew here. Um, I know I have another head chopper around here somewhere. Uh, to, 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 right there. Possibly that could also constitute as a head chopper. Basically, we, we, or the reason why it's called the head chopper, of course, it gives you the illusion that your head is about to hit the railing of this track right here. And of course, for inverted tracks are also called foot choppers I believe as well um let's see I think I have about covered everything about the BNM sit down floorless and possibly stand up coaster um let's see I'm trying to figure something else out because we do have a few more minutes here to kill before I can end it at least for a 20 minute mo uh, video um, I guess other than that, if you guys have any other questions, possibly another kind of video that you might want me to make or possibly to learn about, of course I'm trying to figure, I'm trying to do all the B&M types. Um, I've over this one already covers sit downs, floorless, and stand up coasters. Uh, at least when it comes to uh, ride layout and ride elements, inversions, whatever, whatnot. Um. Well then, yeah, give me any suggestions what you guys want to know about, and I'll try to, to the best of my ability to cover that up. Um, also, there we go, that's what I can do. Um, a few things that I have said in the previous video that I'd like to correct myself on. Um, I did say SNS roller coasters, the ones that look like this. Uh, I think SNS does make coasters, but a more popular company that makes this certain type of coaster are 
is called Vacoma. Vacomas are notorious for making seriously huge, or not huge, seriously bumpy, <laughs> seriously bumpy roller coasters, and of course they have the infamous boomerang coaster. It's your typical um, cloned uh, roller coaster that is possibly the cheapest thing that you can buy if you do own a theme park. There's no custom um, tracks, no custom uh, terrain or anything. You just plop it on down a flat, uh, a flat land, and there you go. You got yourself a boomerang coaster. Um, what else did I say? Oh, also, I was talking about a winged coaster uh, for Cedar Point. I have been corrected. It's called the uh, oh shoot Gatekeeper. Sorry, <laughs> the Gatekeeper. However, I was thinking of a ride that does have a word eagle on it. I just have the wrong name, which I did get it half right, and the wrong park. There is another wing coaster that I was thinking about called Wild Eagle at uh, Dollywood. That was the wing coaster I was thinking about. So, there I am correcting myself. Again, if I do have any other things that I made a mistake either in the last video that I didn't cover or in this video, feel free to um, correct me if I am wrong on anything. Um, that's it for this one. We'll see you guys in the next lesson. Hey guys, thanks for watching our video and as an added bonus, I have had this video of the ride we just, or I just built. Uh, just a POV short of our unnamed roller coaster. Uh, but anyway, thanks again for watching. Um, of course, I will be continuing this Theme Park 101 with a lot more lessons and a lot more uh, roller coasters, rides, and any other tidbits that I know of about theme parks. And if you want, go ahead and please subscribe on the right right there. If you guys want any more of these videos, more will come along the way. And uh, I'd like to also promote another channel that I'm also helped, uh, helping working on uh, for four play reviews. Uh, their four play review channel, they usually go ahead and play up to four players, they play a video game. Um, it's usually just a bunch of, it's like a let's play as well, but of course they go ahead and review some stuff. Um, also a bit of an in-depth look at uh, particular games. Um, and it's, sort of, it's sort of like a doc, not really a documentary per se, but um... It's like also their own little opinions about the current generation of video games and um, also previous generation of video games. Uh, it's also like an in-depth look and like I said, their own opinions of what they think of certain types of video games, uh, the history, uh, the decisions of the companies such as Nintendo, a little bit of Sony, uh, but mostly Nintendo. <laughs> but. Um, I digress with that. Go ahead and check them out if you're also interested in some uh, Let's Plays of other games and just RCT3 that I've just been doing this whole time. Um, but that's about it. Seems like this video for the uh, POV is done, and we'll see you guys in the next videos.